This is CBC Here and Now. It's the sixth version of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment Memorial Hockey Tournament here in Paradise. Nearly 30 teams playing to honour the regiment. I'm Jeremy Eaton, I'm live here and we'll have more details coming up. And especially with high school, I should have been able to talk to him and he should have helped me out with graduating and being there for me with the big change in my life. Let down by the Crown, four years ago her father died on the job. Today, the family still feels the company is to blame. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Heather Gillis filling in for Carolyn Stokes. Tonight, we begin with the murder trial of Kirk Keeping. It's been set over again. He's charged with the death of his former partner, Chantal John, from Con River. About 60 of her supporters were at, from the community were at the Supreme Court today in Grand Falls, Windsor, when Justice Glenn Knoll scheduled jury selection for next April. Here and Now's Troy Turner was also there. It's a song to remember a lost one, a daughter, a cousin, a friend, a member of a close-knit community. It's a song for Chantel John, killed four years ago. It is very important to, to our people. It's because we always consider ourselves as like a, we're a family. Not just Chantel or my brothers and sisters, but the entire community. We're all family. Chantel John was killed in January 2019. This man, Kirk Keeping, was charged with first degree murder shortly after. But the case has experienced a series of delays since. Most recently, Keeping appealed a court decision to have private legal expenses paid by the Department of Justice. That matter will be heard next month. In a packed courtroom today, his trial date was set for next April. My sister-in-law and my brother, like, I know they're very, very upset, right? Because, like, they lost their daughter, right? And now they got to wait another, another year for this man to be brought to trial. The outpouring of support for Chantel John has spread well beyond the community of 3,000. We're here to sh get, show our support and to let people realize that it is one of our answers, or our people that has been taken away from us brutally, which that should have never ever happened. Because something like that on our reserve, it does not happen at, at all. It was a shocking thing for all of us. Drew says the community will keep a close eye on this court case in the months ahead and watch for each next appearance as it unfolds. It's all about remembering Chantel, one of their own, she says will never be forgotten. Troy Turner, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. Still with news related to the courts, the family of a man killed in a workplace accident in Stephenville feel let down by the Crown Prosecutor. Gerard Drover died while on the job at College of the North Atlantic in 2019. Earlier this month, a judge dismissed a charge against a contractor and the Crown says it won't appeal that decision. Here now's Daryl Roberts has that story. It's not the same here anymore. It's like don't have the energy it used to have. It's like it's empty here now. Things haven't been the okay. same since Sarah Drover's dad died almost four years ago. And there's always that like wonder and like question in the back of your head like what if he never went to work that day? And... Gerard Drover was working on the new CNA campus in Stephenville when he was struck by a ceiling fan. He died a few days later. Here at the family home in Spaniards Bay, his daughter finds ways to feel connected. We never played together, but after he passed away, I found a video of him singing. So I used to like play along to videos of him singing and stuff. In 2021, two years after Drover's death, the company responsible for the site, Pomerlo, was charged with four workplace safety violations. Three charges were dropped. The fourth was dismissed last month. When Justice Carrie Ann Pike said the Crown didn't prove Pomerlo was responsible as Drover's employer since he was working for a subcontractor. The judge also said the Crown didn't prove Pomerlo failed to maintain safety standards. Pomerlo wouldn't do an interview. Drover's family has been told the Crown won't appeal. Just like 
right back to day one. Yeah, same feelings. You think you're starting to work through th some things and then all of a sudden you're just right back, right back to the beginning. Jover's wife, Darlene, is shocked. She believes Pomerlo is at fault. Even though he was contracted out, he was still an employee in that building and the main contractor, as far as I'm concerned, should, is responsible for everyone in that building and they should have been held responsible. The Crown wouldn't comment on Jover's case specifically, but in an email said appeal courts should not interfere with decisions unless there's a clear error that affected the outcome. We do this in light of the legislation, precedent, and facts of the case. Darlene believes legislation should be stronger. They're not protecting workers. If they were, well, we wouldn't have had this outcome today. No, stricter rules should be enforced. Um, I think companies, I think, are more interested in getting the job done and on time rather than keeping that their workers safe. Sarah Studley, the minister responsible for occupational health and safety, also turned down an interview request. Anything that went wrong, I went to him. I depended on him for... He was it. He was my best friend. He was my sounding board. He was... He was everything. And now I got to try to navigate through all this without him. It's not easy. Daryl Roberts, CBC News, Spaniards Bay. In other news, a story that CBC brought to light last week was raised in Newfoundland and Labrador's House of Assembly today. The province's education minister says it's unacceptable that children with autism and other exceptionalities have been dismissed from daycares due to staff shortages. Last week, CBC reported a series of stories about children losing services at daycares in this province. Advocates say dozens of children with autism have been dismissed from daycare due to those staff shortages, a lack of inclusion workers. The children with physical disabilities have also been dismissed. Parents say the cancellation of inclusion support programs are forcing them to choose between their jobs or leaving the province. Here's John Haggie's response. No child with or without exceptionality should be displaced from a daycare uh, for reasons like this. It is utterly unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. It has unfortunately been going on in one form or another for decades. We have recognized this as a problem. We began a review of the inclusion program. We are engaged with the operators and we look forward to progress rapidly. It is of interest perhaps to the member that we actually have more disability inclusion staff working now in childcare than we had in 2019. Meanwhile, Premier Andrew Fury says he will look at potentially increasing funding for Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. Today, the Premier said he'd be willing to speak with the Board of Regents and the university's acting president about the possibility of re-establishing provincial funding for a tuition freeze. This comes days after a meeting with the acting president as well as the faculty and student representatives at the Confederation Building. I committed to looking at funding uh, and to listening to all sides. Uh, to if, if funding is an issue causing instability currently, um, we do not want this institution to become more unstable and more uncertain. I think that that will harm the reputation of the university, will take decades uh, to recover. Uh, so if we were very open uh, at um, having those conversations with the different stakeholders, including the Board of Regents, because we don't set tuition, of course. And in Quebec, the lights are back on. Almost half a million customers lost power earlier this afternoon because of issues at Churchill Falls. A spokesperson for Hydro-Quebec said there was a loss of production from turbo generators at the upper Churchill generating station. And that caused an automatic shutdown on the network. The utility is investigating the failure, but said the network reacted correctly. Service is gradually being restored and there's no timeline on when everything will be back to normal. Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro said all units at Churchill Falls are back online. Well, the weather today, beautiful for a good chunk of the province. Take a look at this. Uh, lots of sunshine out there. We do have a little bit of cloud cover moving back in for coastal areas of Labrador. Uh, but as you head towards Goose Bay, an absolutely beautiful evening. We're sitting under generally a ridge of high pressure. That's what's keeping things nice and clear across a good chunk of uh, the big land. But 
That is not the case again along the northeast coast. Still looking at uh, those very chilly temperatures. In fact, take a look live outside right now. We've got that fog, some flurries in the mix as well. Temperatures currently sitting at about zero degrees in St. John's. Those winds a bit brisk as well uh, out of the north northeast around 39 kilometers per hour. So essentially our headlines are Groundhog Day for the northeast coast. Spring like weather elsewhere, but we do have some showers moving in across Labrador. We'll talk all about that when I come back. And ice is making crossing at the Strait of Belle Isle trickier than usual. The Kayak W connects Newfoundland to Labrador. An icebreaker wasn't available today, so heavy ice pressure cancelled today's daily crossing. But the service had been going fairly smoothly. Over the past couple of days, the Coast Guard icebreaker Jean Goodwill has been helping clear the way. Labrador Marine says there's plenty of ice in the area and it will be weeks not just days before it all clears out. The Kayak W will continue to try to offer its daily crossing until May 1st. That's when it will increase crossings with its hybrid spring schedule. Staying on the ice now, 28 hockey teams from across the province are facing off in paradise. But it's not your typical tournament. The Invitational is run by a board of directors comprised of former members of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and other volunteers. The aim? To pay tribute to the regiment's rich legacy. Jeremy Eaton is ringside at the Paradise Double Ice Complex. And he is going to join us live. And I understand today is a pretty big day for the regiment. Yeah, that's right, Heather. We're here at the Paradise Double Ice Complex uh, to take in a, the Royal Newfoundland Regiment Memorial Hockey Tournament. But nobody wants to hear what I have to say, so I'm joined by a couple of the, the men who are behind this. Gerard, uh, thanks for joining us, first of all. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. So one of the questions I've been asked today is, what's the connection between the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and hockey? Okay, so, I mean, like these kids here, the young, uh, young soldiers from the regiment of World War I were young, young, uh, young adults. They were enthusiastic, full of energy, and like anything, they, they wanted to play hockey. And uh, one of the prides, certainly, from that the whole period in World War I is that it was the esprit de corps and the pride of the regiment when this hockey, hockey team suited up and played various uh, Canadian teams and the Canadian Expeditionary Force team and that sort of stuff. So that's the connection really. It's the youth of the day. And those people were young back then and they were doing the same thing as these hockey players are doing today. Now I had the opportunity to talk to a number of hockey players and they're very excited, but there are a lot of hockey players. So we have, is it 28 teams? Am I correct, John? Correct, yes. Yeah, 28 teams, there's 16 boys teams and 12 girls. How, what kind of logistical nightmare is it to try to organize that many teams from uh, all around mm -hmm. the island? It's, it's a fair bit of work. It's about a year, uh, year's work at the end of the day. I mean, not all at once, but uh, it, it's, it's a fair bit of work uh, getting the teams organized, making sure they're approved under Hackney Newfoundland, um, picking the teams that take part in the tournament. Obviously, we have more teams than we can take, and we'd love to take more teams. Obviously, we only got so much ice time, uh, but going through the process of qualifying teams is, is quite the logistics uh, nightmare, to say a little bit, you know, the least, so... Yeah. So we have a number of uh, athletes here today that we spoke to a number of them. We're going to hear from them later on the show, but they have connections to the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. A lot of great greats put in there because it was such a long oh, time yeah, ago yeah, for many. Yeah, yeah. How important is that uh, to the organizing committee to have descendants of, uh, of the regiment playing here today or oh, this week? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that really is the connection piece uh, that we speak about all the time, that every Newfoundlander down through history has been connected back to the regiment of World War I. Uh, I mean, again, like you said, we got many great, great, greats in there now, and uh, and it's good to see. And and we were, we want to build that history piece. We want to show that tradition. We want to make that connection, so that the youth of the day were connected to this regiment as long back as World War One. So this tournament is is in its sixth year now, and so that it's mainly just been a boys tournament. But this year you added a female division. Do you want to talk about the reason behind that, John? Well, we've, we've wanted to add uh, females for a number of years since we started the tournament. Uh, unfortunately, it just hasn't worked out. Uh, but this year, when we started with the new organization, uh, is one of the first things we said was, if we're going to do this, we want to include the girls' side of things. Uh, and luckily enough, we've been you know blessed with having 12 great girls' hockey teams here, and they get to enjoy it just like the boys. 
Now, uh, we're going to wrap up quickly, but I know that this tournament started yesterday. Uh, and when does it run? How long does it run for? So the tournament started yesterday, the 24th, the Monday, and, uh, and it runs right now till Sunday with the championship uh, team uh, games slated for Mon uh, Sunday. Sorry, Girls at 1.30, the boys at 3.30. Uh, great hockey all week long. Uh, so we invite you to come on down, see some of these uh, players enjoy themselves and some great hockey. Now, we've got to wrap it up, but I want to give you a quick plug. Uh, also, the opening ceremonies, uh, skills come. Yeah, Real quick. The opening ceremony skill competition Thursday uh, starts at uh, 6.30. Uh, great competition uh, in skills side of the house. And uh, there's going to be over 120 soldiers or, or people involved in the opening ceremony. So come on out and enjoy it. Perfect. Well, uh, Gerard, John, I appreciate both your time. Now, as I said, I did talk to a number of players who have connections to the Royal New Flame Regiment, and we're going to hear from them later on in the show. Reporting live from Paradise, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. Thank you, Jeremy. Good to see how the province's history, hockey, and those high schoolers are all intertwined there. And in more news from Newfoundland and Labrador's high schools, the province has handed out 15 RISE awards. The research-inspired Student Enrichment Awards are given to grade 11 students who excel in science, technology, engineering, and math. One of those students will attend a six-week enrichment program at the Research Science Institute in Boston, Four students will also head to that city for a three-week program at the Boston Leadership Institute. Ten students will attend the Da Vinci Engineering Enrichment Program for four weeks this summer in Toronto. The provincial government is spending roughly $200,000 to cover tuition, accommodations and travel stipends. You are and will continue to make a difference and every one of us in this room is incredibly proud because when we look at the future, we see you. And I got to tell you, looking at the resumes of all the young people here and the others that applied and that are not sitting here, I think we have a pretty bright future. Well, people say icebergs bring the fog in, but is there any truth to that? I'll have that and the forecast.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Early bird prize deadline is midnight Friday, May 5th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. It's iceberg season and lots of people are heading out to take a look and snap a pic. It may feel chilly out there, but don't blame the bergs for the nip in the air. It's a popular myth that icebergs affect the temperature. It's actually the wind that makes the air chilly along the coast. Around this time of year, ocean temperatures are near or just below zero, and that cools the air as it blows over the water, whether there's an iceberg out there or not. But on the northeast coast, there is actually a benefit associated with those chilly northerly winds. It pushes the icebergs closer, giving us a better view. Now those warmer southerly winds will push the icebergs out back to sea. So right now we can thank the cold winds for bringing the bergs and then go back to complaining about the windy weather for the rest of the year. <laughs> so it's not the big ice cubes in the ocean that's making it cold. Nope, <laughs> it is. It's very popular though. I hear all the time mm -hmm. that uh, those icebergs are making it cold, but that is not the case. All right, and is it going to continue to be kind of cold over the next little while? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I do see a bit of a break in the weather, which is good as we mm -hmm. head into mid next week. So we might see some sunshine uh, here in the metro area, but lots of other places are seeing some beautiful weather today and have been uh, for the last little bit. Let's take a look at those temperatures topped out at 13 degrees so far in Stephenville this afternoon. The hot spot Churchill Falls yet again at 14 degrees. But uh, yeah, much cooler as you look towards the coast. Two degrees was the afternoon high in St. John's today. Now we also have some breezy winds. Those northerlies, <laughs> 43 kilometer per hour sustained winds right now in Bonavista. And uh, St. John's, you're currently sitting at 28 kilometers per hour. If we factor in those wind gusts uh, closer to 40. So we are going to see these winds uh, generally stick around. They're causing a bit of a wind chill out there, feeling more like minus six for St. John's right now and minus eight in Twilling Gate. So if you are towards the coast, you're checking out the icebergs, you are certainly going to want to bundle up. So here's the winds as we head through tonight and into tomorrow. Essentially, eastern Newfoundland will hang on to those wind gusts out of the north somewhere between 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. The rest of the island uh, between 20 and 40 and up across Labrador. A beautiful afternoon expected uh, tomorrow as you see generally light winds, but they will start to creep in uh, as we get into Thursday morning. Now, as far as visibility is concerned, we've been talking about that RDF down to uh, visibility is down to 0 0.8 kilometers at the uh, airport at the moment. Even in Gander, seeing some reduced visibility 2.4 kilometers. Uh, but other than that, pretty much unlimited. We will start to see some of that cloud cover, though, creep right back in as we're sitting under a ridge of high pressure. But as we lose that daytime uh, heating again, we are going to see that cloud cover continue to creep. You can already see it happening uh, right now and the future tracker doing a good job at showing that moving back in. Now we're also talking about the potential for some flurries, drizzle or even freezing drizzle as we head through the night tonight. Now not being really picked up on the future tracker, but that's certainly the story in uh, along the northeast coast. West coast, south coast looks beautiful tonight and we'll start to see some of that cloud cover creep right back in across coastal areas of Labrador as well as we get into the morning hours. Temperatures tonight hovering around the zero degree mark, hence that risk of some freezing drizzle. You may have to scrape uh, tomorrow morning and uh, otherwise those winds will be out of the north again tonight. And now for Marystown, looks like you should be the hot spot at two degrees overnight tonight. And then up across Labrador, your temperatures will be hovering there or uh, just below zero. But uh, again, relatively light winds will be the story for you. So as we head through tomorrow, future tracker uh, again, not showing too much, but we're still looking at that risk of some flurries, the drizzle, the freezing drizzle, particularly in the morning as those temperatures are going to stay a bit cooler. But uh, the cloud cover should again start to retreat closer to the coast and some sunshine up across Labrador uh, as we head into the afternoon hours. Now, as the day goes on, uh, it does look like some showers will develop for Lab West and then head, which is different from what we typically see. We normally see things travel west to east, but they're actually going to come in from the east and uh, head across uh, Lab West as we head into the overnight and early morning hours 
on Thursday. So temperatures tomorrow, again, pretty much a carbon copy forecast of what we saw today. Temperatures between two, three degrees and those breezy northerly winds away from that. You're looking at uh, that sunshine, particularly a beer and peninsula Marystown. You're looking at uh, nine degrees through tomorrow. Now chance of better chance of some showers along the south coast of um, uh, or should I say up the shore now as far as central is concerned three to six degrees a little cooler in Harbor Breton than it has been over the last little bit because a little bit more cloud cover will be in the mix uh, but overall as you head towards the west coast that's where the nicest weather will be along the south coast Port of Aspergio seven eight degrees through the day but much warmer as you head a little bit further north Stephenville will hover around 11. Northern Peninsula between three and about six degrees through the day. Generally light winds. Don't be surprised to see that cloud cover sticking around though. Although you may see a few peaks of sun, so that will be lovely through the day. But again, the warm spot will be somewhere between Happy Valley Goose Bay and Churchill Falls, where your temperatures should sit between 12 to 14 degrees. Lab City, you may hover around this, maybe a degree more. But again, your showers will move in as you head into the evening hours. Now, temperatures are going to warm up again. I'll talk about that coming up. These Atlantic Canadian kids are saying bon voyage. They're a part of a group called Dreams Take Flight, a nonprofit organization that takes children to Disney World for a day. The big trip was supposed to happen back in 2020, but that was delayed because of the pandemic. 140 children from across Atlantic Canada are leaving first thing tomorrow from Halifax Airport. I'm looking forward to like just being there, honestly, like just seeing what it's like. Especially because, uh, like leaving Canada because I've never left Canada before, so I'm really excited about that. As, same thing with being on a plane. I've never been on a plane before. I feel like most people, it's a dream to go to Disney. Oh, I'm probably looking forward to like Splash Castle and stuff like that. Like stuff that's like there at Disney, like the really cool rides. I feel like it's been an eternity since I got the notice. I feel mm. like I haven't slept very much. Well, I'm glad to see they're making the changes. That's certainly helpful for people that. Uh, you know, we'll go through this in the future. It doesn't really apply to us. I guess there won't be any uh, looking back at previous claims that have been denied. What will new airline compensation rules mean for travelers? I'll speak with a longtime advocate to get his thought on the plan for an overhauled passenger bill of rights.
This is street photographer Richie Perez. He's been showing up all over Newfoundland and Labrador, meeting folks and taking their pictures, but also talking to them and connecting with their stories, with their communities. Wednesdays this month on Here and Now, you will meet Richie and some of these people. We're calling it The Signal Connects. It's not just the wind and fog causing frustrations at the St. John's International Airport. It has been a chaotic couple of years for many Canadian travellers looking to fly. So much so that yesterday, Canada's Transport Minister Omar al Gabra announced a new passenger bill of rights. He overhauled it and for years Woodrow French has been a big advocate for an air passenger bill of rights. He's joining me now from Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're quite welcome. So the updated Bill of Rights is supposed to tighten loopholes that airlines use to avoid compensating passengers, and it toughens penalties for those airlines as well. Woodrow, what is your first impression of this overhauled passenger Bill of Rights? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that the government's on the right track here in uh, plugging some of the loopholes. They've still got a long way to go, and, um, you know, I'm still the advocate for going for a... Bill of Rights that's similar to the uh, European Union Bill of Rights. And um, basically, we're still asking for good service to get us from point A to point B, and we seem to be still fighting. Mm -hmm. The Federal Transport Minister, Omar al Gabra says if passed through the House of Commons, this legislation that will create the new rules will put the onus on airlines to prove that a delay or cancellation was due to a safety concern, say like a mechanical problem. What's your thought on that? Well, that's a good point, and and that's a that's where the responsibility should rest. Again, it's it's still pretty loose with regard to, um, you know, what the airlines are going to tell you, and what they're going to compensate you for, and what they're not going to compensate you for. So I think it's still going to be a struggle. And um, he reduced the um, the response time from, uh, uh, I think it was 120 days down to 90 days. And right now, there's about a year and a half backlog at the Canadian Transportation Agency with regard to complaints. And I want to touch on something that you just mentioned. The Canadian Transportation Agency is dealing with a backlog of 45,000 complaints that wait of a year and a half that you just mentioned. The new Bill of Rights says it is going to force airlines to deal with those complaints faster. How do you think that'll help people? Well, it's it, in theory, it should work a bit faster. He's given more money to the uh, Canadian Transportation Agency to get more people involved with the complaints that they have. And plus, he's made it a requirement for the airlines to have somebody in-house um, that's dealing with uh, customer complaints. So I'm hoping that it's going to speed the process up somewhat. But, you know, with a year and a half backlog uh, to start off, I think it's going to be a while for some people that have been fighting for probably three or four months or, or longer to, to try to get their complaints resolved, even through the Canadian Transportation Agency. Mm -hmm. Now, airlines pushing back, saying they shouldn't be uh, penalized for adhering to high safety standards. What do you think of that response? Well, the, um, you know, uh, the airlines certainly have to keep a high standard. I mean, just to keep these sophisticated aircraft in the air uh, means that there's certainly going to be an emphasis on safety. I think the caution here for the airlines is not to loop everything around the word safety and to um, keep their passengers uh, in mind when it comes to getting them from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And one of those things would be baggage. We've heard a lot about lost bags, delayed bags over last summer and the peak Christmas travel season. Uh, people will be compensated now for bags that are delayed. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, again, you know, um, baggage has been it's come a long way with regard to uh, compensation. I mean, at one time uh, you were paid by um, how much your bag weighed so much per pound and, you know, if you had a good suit or a good dress in the bag, it, it never came close to compensating you for that. Now, they've upped that uh, quite a bit. And um, so, you know, again, the, the responsibility for that in most cases rests with the airport authorities because so in some cases they provide the third parties that are going to handle your luggage. What else would you have liked to have seen in this overhaul of the Bill of Rights? Well, I would have certainly liked to have seen them, you know, um, 
um, more um, service issues being addressed in the Bill of Rights. In other words, he's come a long ways by saying that, uh, you know, you're innocent under proven guilty, that the, you know, the, the emphasis now falls on the airlines. You know, we still go back, or at least I still go back to the basis that once we buy a ticket from an airline, uh, that's a contract that we enter into. And, um, you know, they have to uphold their end of the bargain to get us from point A to point B. Okay, well, Woodrow French, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us this evening. Thank you very much for including me. And as you just heard, the Federal Transport Minister says it'll no longer be a passenger's responsibility to prove to an airline that they are entitled to compensation, but that's cold comfort for a couple in St. John's. They call their experience this past summer with Air Canada and their compensation rules confusing and arbitrary. Sophia Harris has more on their story. We look forward to welcoming you on board again. Yeah. When this couple flew to Rome last summer, their Air Canada flight was delayed by about six hours. An exhausting day after our yeah. night of travel. Three family members on their flight each got $400 compensation. So the couple expected to get cash too. But Air Canada rejected their claim, stating their delay was safety related. I felt confused. It seems like the onus is on me to try and prove why we should be compensated versus Air Canada, you know, bearing the burden of proof. Really confusion again is all I can say as to how they're applying their policies. It seems like maybe whoever processed the claims in Air Canada weren't all the same person and, and maybe different people were using different criteria to decide whether or not a claim would be, be denied or be uh, compensated for. He's still frustrated. Air Canada told CBC News it stands by its compensation denial. Gorman filed a complaint with the CTA, but it has a backlog of 45,000 grievances. Well, I'm glad to see they're making the changes. That's certainly helpful for people that, uh, you know, will go through this in the future. But, you know, we, we feel we've been unjustly denied compensation. So, uh, you know, it doesn't really apply to us. I guess there won't be any uh, looking back at previous claims that have been denied. But I think in this case, given that other people on our flight were compensated and we weren't, that Air Canada should reopen that and, 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 and look at past claims. So it's, you know, it's a positive move forward, but it's still disappointing that a lot of us, and I guess we're in the thousands or tens of thousands of people who've been denied by Air Canada over the last year are, are still left uh, out in the cold. The proposed changes also include a plan to speed up the complaints process. Ottawa says the amendments will take effect at the earliest opportunity. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. Hockey action continues here in paradise with Carboneer playing Clarenville here on the rink behind me. Now coming up after the break, we're going to hear from some of the players and their connections to the Royal Newfoundland Regiment.
Welcome back to Here Now. It is a big week for hockey in paradise. The 2023 Royal Newfoundland Regiment Memorial High School Hockey Tournament is well underway. And for the first time ever, there's a female division. 16 boys teams and 12 girls teams from across the province are taking part. Our Jeremy Eaton is checking out the on-ice action in paradise. Jeremy, what are the players saying about all of this? Well, Heather, as everyone knows, many people in this province have a connection to the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and some of the hockey players in this tournament are no different. Now earlier today in between some of the many games that are being played we had the chance to chat to a number of them about their connection and why this tournament is special to play in. Jessica what are you and the Ascension Collegiate uh, hockey team doing here in Paradise? Uh, we're playing in the first ever girls Beaumont Hamill tournament. My great great grandfather Wallace Pike was uh, he fought in the first world war. And what does it mean to you to be able to play in a tournament that honors people like your great great grandfather Wallace Pike? Um, I think personally, I think it means a lot, um, making my family proud, making him proud. I know he's watching me from up above. Do you have a family connection to the Royal Newfoundland Regiment? I do. Yes, uh, it's my great great uncle Leonard Snow. He fought in the First World War. What does it mean to you to be able to play in a tournament that honors somebody that you most likely didn't meet? Well, it means a lot because in some way it's like I'm making them proud that we're doing something in honor of them. What does it mean for you to be able to play in a tournament like this? Um, I guess it just like means like I can just like show that like keep like keep like my family has like meant a lot to me and like I'm grateful for people who served in the war. Well, my great great grandfather was in the war, so that's my connection to it. And uh, is there any special significance to you to be able to play in a tournament like this? Um, it just shows how like the women's hockey league's developing in like Newfoundland, which is really like important, and it's amazing. I just can't really imagine like what they had to go through and like the conditions and everything. Like I can't wrap my head around it. I'm really excited. It's my last tournament for high school hockey, so. I understand that you have a connection to the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. Do you know anything about that? I do. It was my great-grandfather, Daniel Linehan. Um, he was in the 59th Regiment. So as you know, uh, a long time ago, a bunch of people your age, young men your age, left Newfoundland to go off and fight in wars. Now, 100 plus years later, is, is that something, is that hard for you to wrap your head around, that people your age were going off to Europe to fight? Yeah, it's crazy to think about uh, for the world we live in now compared to back then. And uh, what, what are you most looking forward to about this hockey tournament, other than it being your last one? Playing with my team for the last time, I guess, and being able to honor everyone that fought in the world war for us and everything. I'm an infantier at the Royal New Flame Regiment. What does that mean for people who don't know? Uh, that means, well, the Royal New Flame Regiment is an infantier unit, so basically, most, when most people think about Army, they think about infantiers, honestly, but yeah. So how is it that you can serve at the age of 17? Uh, actually with the reserves, you can sign up at 16 with parent uh, permission. So when did you sign up for the, the regiment? Uh, the day I turned 16. Why did you want to do that, Jamie? Uh, something to be proud of, like it's uh, something bigger than yourself. And uh, you know, I thought, why not? So that's just some of the players that have connections to the Royal Newfoundland Regiment or the military. Now, according to organizers, about 50 players have connections to both of those, the Royal Newfoundland Regiment or the Canadian military. Now, this tournament just got underway yesterday. It's going to run all week until the championship games on Sunday. Skills competition is on Thursday. And the organizers say if you want to learn more, just hop on to the, Royal, the World Wide Web and uh, check out their website. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in Paradise. Tens of thousands of federal public workers are on strike for the seventh day. As their union, the Public Service Alliance of Canada continues to negotiate with Ottawa. Today, the union made good on its plan to ramp up picket lines in strategic locations, limiting access to some office buildings. Key issues for the union are higher wages, remote work and job security. About 
100,000 workers are off the job. More than 50,000 have been deemed essential and remain working. There are growing calls for Sunday's tax deadline to be extended in the light of this labor action. And there are three new medical schools opening in Canada in the next two years. Their goal is to encourage more students to enter family medicine to help address the shortage across the country. But as CBC's Karen Pauls reports, there are concerns that adding students to the mix will just add to the demand on doctors' time. This is the site of the new medical school at the University of Prince Edward Island. It's under construction now, but in 2025, 20 new students will start learning here. Our students will be trained uh, in a kind of inclusive environment with working with uh, nurse practitioners, nurses. Uh, we'll have an on-site clinic here uh, that is uh, what's called a medical home, which is an interdisciplinary uh, program that uh, that will uh, have patients from the university community, but also the broader community, and students will learn in that environment. This is just one of the three new medical schools being built in Canada in the next few years. The other two are at Toronto Metropolitan and Simon Fraser Universities. And they're being built on a new model of education, where students will train in the communities where they'll serve after they graduate. In the uh, Brampton area and the Peter region, are a very diverse and uh, uh, fast-growing uh, region here. Uh, doctors trained at uh, this medical school uh, will be prepared to work with diverse and underserved communities, allowing them to uh, provide healthcare that is culturally respectful because of the nature of the region. But there's a concern that there aren't even enough doctors to see patients, never mind taking on the extra responsibility of teaching. My worries start when I try to figure out how do we bring this number of trainees into a system which is frankly, we're, we're just scrambling to keep the lights on every day, right? And we don't have enough doctors to do the clinical work that we need to do. And having been in academia my whole life, I know that when you bring learners in, I don't see as many patients at all. The hope is that medical students and residents will take the pressure off their supervising physicians because they'll get more hands-on experience earlier in their training. And we know from a patient care perspective that physicians who are involved in education are both challenged to stay up to date so they can teach and challenged by their learners, even very junior learners. So the quality of care increases for patients who are seen. If you're teaching, the learners will go see patients and your time comes out in the wash as far as patient care goes. So I, I don't think it's going to negatively impact the number of patients seen. The ultimate goal is to retain existing family doctors while training new ones. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Charlottetown. To the U.S. now, President Joe Biden has made it official. He is running for re-election in 2024. This is not a time to be complacent. That's why I'm running for re-election. The Biden announcement was widely expected, and today's video was made public exactly four years after he officially entered the 2020 race. Biden is 80 years old right now, and he was the oldest person to be elected U.S. president when he took office at the age of 78.
Welcome back. And before we get Ashley's forecast, we have a cute video to share with you. So we're dog people, both you and I, <laughs> so sorry if you're not. <laughs> yeah, there's a library in Vancouver that strongly believes dogs are readers' best friend. Take a look. Pause for Stories helps kids who are struggling to read by pairing them with a four-legged friend. Children pick their favorite book to read aloud to a therapy dog and gain reading practice in a relaxing and adorable environment. <laughs> People do have to book in advance. The dogs are very popular and librarians say the sessions help kids boost their confidence. And as you can see there, they get tails wagging. <laughs> All right, where can we start that here? Oh, how sweet is that? <laughs> Just love I would it. love that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would love that as a kid too. Probably did read to my dog though. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I, I did. I would love it now. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we looking ahead to in the weather? Uh, well, uh, it's a whole lot of the same. I, I really am serious. I could probably just record it and play it over and over <laughs> again over the next week or so. However, I do see a few breaks in the cloud cover, hopefully, in, but we have to wait till next week. Okay. Unfortunately, people looking forward to that. Yeah, let's take a look at what's going on uh, as we head through the evening hours on Wednesday and uh, into Thursday. So things are going to be a bit more unsettled than they have been, particularly across uh, Lab West. We'll see a bit more cloud cover and the chances some showers lingering through the day. Things should clear out, though, as we get into the evening hours. But again, we're still in that onshore flow. So areas across the Avalon will see the RDF continue should hover around one degree. But it does look like there's a bit more sunshine in the forecast than there has been for other areas along the coast. Uh, Gander, seven degrees, five in uh, St. Anthony. So you're not really seeing the temperatures up much, but the, the amount of sunshine is certainly increasing. Now towards coast of Labrador, Cartwright, you're going to start to talk about the chances some showers or flurries, and that's because your temperatures are still hovering around three degrees. You get towards central Labrador, Happy Valley Goose Bay. 12 as your daytime high and then back down to single digits uh, for Lab City. But again, that's thanks to the rain uh, that is going to move in. Now for the South Coast, West Coast, again, beautiful spring day, 9 to 10 degrees as your daytime highs. And note what happens as we head into Friday, much of the same. However, it does look like we're going to see the better chance of showers or flurries along the coast as we get into the afternoon and evening hours on Friday. And then some of that cloud cover will uh, continue to push a little bit further south. So, you know, temperatures are a bit cooler than they have been for the West Coast. Six degrees in Corner Brook for your Friday. Again, two to six degrees along the coast and then cooler temperatures uh, for Labrador, especially the West. So down to about three degrees in Lab City through the day on Friday. But another double digit day expected in Port of Basque where you'll hover around 11 degrees. Now, long range forecast is getting a tad warmer. I put four degrees in there for us at the end of Sunday. Uh, but as we head into next week, uh, it does look like Wednesday, Thursday, there is a chance we will see the sun. Don't hold me to it, but it is that glimmer of hope that we are all going to hang on to. Now for central Newfoundland, things will get uh, unsettled again Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But look at western Newfoundland. Beautiful weather, 11 degrees by the time we get into the weekend. Eastern Labrador, you're looking at a nice stretch as well, uh, six to 10 degrees, and then uh, eventually it will warm up for those of you in Lab West. You'll get back to the double digits just in time for the weekend. Now this shot, viewer photo of the day. Sunsets, oh. we haven't seen a whole lot of them, <laughs> uh, but this one was in Port de Chois, and uh, Tammy shared this great shot with us. And if you have any weather photos, send them to Facebook or best place though, is to email them, and on photos at cbc.ca. Wow, Tammy, that is really nice. Certainly missing the sun, that's for sure. I had to laugh when I saw just the band of gray weather for the East Coast here. Let's move this show to the West Coast of the island. That's what I said. I should go to Sandbanks Provincial Park. Why not? Let's go hang out there for a little while. Beautiful. <laughs> Sounds like a great road trip. Anyway, that's it for our show this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Good night.